it'll stay. All right, there we go. Yeah. All right, Nick. Well, it's good talking to you again. It's been, gosh, more than 15 minutes, I think. Since <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having okay. me, Sean. Um, I didn't talk about this here. All right. So we wanted to talk about, uh, there's a lot of things that are going on right now. Specifically, the point of this talk is uh, there was a study published in, I can't remember the name of the journal, two years ago, Kevin Hall's group, did a study which showed that people going on a low-fat diet uh, and then switching over to low-carb diet, you know, randomized controlled trial in a metabolic word, showed that the people eating the low-fat diet ate less calories than the people on the uh, animal-based higher-fat diet. So it was low, low it was low fat plant-based versus low carb animal based. And according to Kevin Hall, the folks on the low fat plant-based diet had a better outcome because they ate less calories. And that was published to very wide public attention. You guys have reanalyzed the data uh, and have found something that was particularly, uh, I guess, interesting. I'll let you, I'll let, I'll let you yeah. kind of expand upon that. So first I'll give a hat tip to the um, lead authors of this paper, Adrian Sotomoda and Lisa Jansen, who did a lot of the bulk of the work. So I'm here as a representative and uh, middle author, but hats off to them and our senior author, David Ludwig. But um, the paper that we reanalyzed or data from the paper we reanalyzed was a 2021 metabolic ward style as you met, um, metabolic ward trial, as you mentioned, published in Nature Medicine. So a very prestigious journal. And the design of the trial sounds really good. It sounds like a really high quality, rigorous trial, which is it's randomized control trial. So, um, you know, people get randomized to two different treatment conditions and is a crossover trial. So everybody's their own control. So in this case, there were 20 participants and they either went low carb, then low fat or low fat and low carb, but everybody did both things and then swapped over to the other one. They did it in a random order. So 10 people did one first, 10 people did the other first. Importantly, and we'll get why it's important in a minute, but there wasn't a washout period. So you took people, put them in a metabolic ward, fed them the one diet, then they ran straight into the other diet. And the ultimate, the, the primary outcome from this study was caloric intake. That's what they were concerned with. They said, all right, we have a plant-based low-fat diet and an animal-based ketogenic diet. Animal-based, we can talk about what that actually meant in a minute, but... Um, um, basically those are the comparators and they wanted to see which led to a, um, larger, uh, caloric intake and the, uh, extension of the logic, their logic would be, oh, you know, if your diet leads you to eat more calories then it's going to be, um, worse for weight gain. And what they concluded in this initial trial was that the animal based low carb diet led to, um, increased caloric intake. If you took, you know, all the 20 participants and you accumulated their time on the low carb diet, they ended up eating more calories than if you accumulated their time on the low fat diet. And so this has stood for a couple of years as um, it, they even say in the paper, this contradicts the carbohydrate insulin model um, of obesity. Now, we've really taken a look at the data. And, and although it sells really well on the surface, randomized, randomized crossover metabolic ward trial, there's a fundamental flaw in the logic of the data, which has to do with these massive diet carryover effects, whereby one treatment affects the other treatment. In, in this particular case, whereby low carb or low fat, whatever comes first, metabolically primes the participant to impact the other phase. So what we end up finding, I'll just kind of give the spoiler and then we can go through the data, was that there was a massive, massive advantage to having low carb first. The low carb first led to metabolic adaptations that led to um, less energy intake in the following phase versus when you had low fat first, there was a major disadvantage. And importantly, the effect size of the diet order was so massive um, that it was larger than the effect size of the actual diets themselves. And we can show graphs that prove that effect. In fact, Kevin Hall has a, a, a preprint of his own demonstrating the effect of diet order, which is just absolutely monumental and effectively invalidates the results of the prior trial. While also we have some data supporting that the trial actually supports the carbohydrate insulin model. You can look at biomarkers of insulin release and see how they predict weight gain and energy intake. So basically um, what we did was we took this prior trial, exposed, well, 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 built upon what was an acknowledged 
flaw in the trial, which wasn't acknowledged in the initial paper. Actually, I'll read a section from the initial paper in 2021. They said diet order effects for primary outcomes were analyzed as carryover effects. As reported in the main text, the carryover effects were not significant, were therefore excluded from this final statistical model. So this 2021 Nature paper claims no diet carryover effects. At least that's what the statement there said. Um, but as you'll see, there clearly were. And there weren't actually any data in the initial trial supporting the claim of no diet carryover effects. So there's a little bit of nuance there that we explained in the paper. Um, but with that, I, I would love to know if you have any questions before we start digging into the data and showing just how big the diet carryover effects were and why this really matters. Uh, well, I mean, there's there's a number of questions that I've, I've thought of recently, just based on our discussion the other day uh, that I think you know, maybe, maybe good to jump into later. I mean, obviously Kevin Hall has responded to this and says in all phases, low fat ate less than, than low carb. And my question would be irrespective of the carryover effect, there was an initial starting point, you know, where, where some people start out low carb and some people start out low fat and that low fat group did indeed eat less calories in the low carb do, group during the first two weeks. Correct. Is that, is that, is that a fair assessment irrespective of the carryover effect? What are your thoughts the on low, that? You're saying the low fat group ate fewer calories than the low carb group at the beginning? For the first, for the first two weeks, you know, because they had no, they had no sort of pre previous diet, I guess. I mean, if you, I mean. Actually, no. So you're right. Because of the massive carryover effect, the only valid analysis is the first phase because it hasn't been biased by a prior phase. But actually, if you look at the first phase alone, there's an advantage for low carb over low fat. There was a caloric um, and, advantage. And the best thing there is a, was a caloric advantage. The best thing to actually do will be to look at the second week because then you've actually given a little bit of time for you know the diet to you're, you're adjusting to the new diet. And so the best thing to do is look at the second week of the first phase. That's probably the most influential, least biased section. And we actually did that in our paper. Um, and what we found was that there was um, a, a benefit to the low carb diet on the order of something like 500 calories. Let me see if I can find the um exact commentary it was and this was in our paper okay yeah um with a major dire care major differential carryover effect as occurred here in this 2021 metabolic award paper the only valid test is between participant comparisons in the first treatment period discarding the bias data from the second period though underpowered these tests suggest an advantage for the low carb diet versus the low fat with results opposite direction opposite to direction from the original report. So in favor of low carb. So if you look at week two from the first period, there was where there was like one week to adapt to the diets without bias from the other treatment, energy intake in week two was um, of the first phase was 2,061 calories for low carb and about 2,582 for low fat. Interesting. So yeah. no, there actually was an advantage to um, low carb in the first phase, trending overall. And in the second week, there was an overall advantage. I can show graphs in a minute, just showing you can you can see that quite. Uh, let me see if I can share a screen. And let's just go to desktop. Um, we'll look here. So, can you see the screen? Uh, yep. Yeah. So what you're looking at here was the um, two dietary phases, and what you're looking at is. Um, um, well, let's actually like break this down. So the reply you mentioned, this is the reply to, to our publication that there was a reminder, the low carb diet ate more overall. What you see is all 20 participants lumped, um, for low carb diet here. So, um, here, you know, it was showing on the right box and oranges. If you take all the low carb phases, lump them together. And what was the energy intake for the participants? And you see overall it's higher for the low carb animal based diet than on the left where it's a little bit lower overall. You can see in this kind of ladder plot, it's kind of dipping down to the left, right? So overall, low fat ate less than low carb. This was published in the initial 2021 um, paper. But interestingly, and here I'm actually giving credit, this is figure 2C from the not peer reviewed preprint from Kevin Hall's group himself. What you're looking at here is um, the diets, but broken up by diet order. So the green boxes here correspond to the low fat diet. That's why it's also box and green over there. So um, what you're seeing is low fat in green and then low carb in um, orange. And basically what you see is if you look at just, you know, the first phase, there's they're pretty much on top of each other, but there's a growing gap right around here. But the major, major effect, this gigantic differential is differentiated 
based on what diet came first. So the blue is low fat first and the red is low carb first. And what you see in the red is when you start with low carb first, during the first week, it's basically right on top of the blue, right? Then it dips down in the second week, just like I said. And then because of this metabolic you know, priming effect, you end up with much lower caloric intake here. This is the low fat phase, but it's the low fat phase that came after the low carb phase. So what you're really seeing here, I mean, it doesn't take a PhD to see this graphic over on the right, the latter plot is very, very different than this graphic, because what you're doing in the latter plot is you're taking the orange on the top and the orange on the bottom and you're lumping them. And you're taking the green on the top and the left and the green on the bottom and you're lumping them. So it really muddies the water and obscures the data. And, and that giant gap that you see in phase two, that was the statement that initially they said in the 2021 paper, we looked for this and didn't find it. But what we can clearly see is there was a massive effect. Now to turn to our own um, data for a moment, I can show it here. So this was energy intake and it's grouped by um, um, you know uh, dietary treatments, low carb on the left, low fat on the right. But what you key see here is in each panel, low carb diet first led to um, uh, decreased energy intake. So on the right panel, a low carb diet first, you see much lower energy intake during low carb. And then here on the left, okay, it's labeled low fat diet first, but if it's low fat diet first, that means it's low carb diet second. So low fat diet second means low carb first. So what you see is basically both bottom lines and both panels are low carb diet first, and there's much lower energy intake. And that's then mirrored by um, fat loss. So this is a similar graph, but for fat loss. And what again, you see the low carb diet came first, there was a massive advantage. If the low fat diet came first, there was a disadvantage. Whereas this would be, again, low carb diet first, low fat diet second, there's an advantage to low carb first. So whatever way you slice it, there's an advantage to having the low carb diet first. The diet order effects were massive. And if you look at the um, video abstract, you can actually see this graphed out on beautiful spider web plots that Adrian did. Um, so I would encourage people to kind of go to the link below, watch the video abstract, but you can see the way you break down the spider web plot is the surface area is the magnitude of the effect. And what you end up seeing is this tiny little in inner spider web, which is the diet. And then this massive circumscribing spider web around it, which is the diet order. Basically the diet order effect was much, much bigger than the diet effect, effectively invalidating the overall findings of the initial trial. Um, yeah, so, so, the, so the, the problems with the study, as, as we had discussed the other day, was one, it was inadequate duration of time. Um, two mm -hmm. weeks is just not long enough to see a, a long enough effect. And then the crossover that occurred immediately after without a washout period basically, you know, allowed that carryover effect to happen. So if you would have had a proper washout phase where they went low carb for a month and, and then they waited two or three months and then they went low fat, that would be a that would be a way to sort of eliminate this this huge effect that you saw and you could get a better result. Is that fair to say? Yeah. In an ideal world, and there are definitely practical limitations on um, producing um, studies like this, considering they're very expensive, but you'd want a longer dietary phase because we know there's so much data showing that shifts to macronutrients take time. So when you go on a low-carb ketogenic diet, and anybody listening that's tried low-carb keto knows there's an adjustment period. There's an adaptation period. There's a period of time where your body's enzymes and proteins need to change their expression levels in order to, you know, extract the effects of the diet. So you even saw that in the graph I saw before, where there was, you know, a downtrend in intake in the low carb diet because people are adapting to that dietary phase. Just imagine for a minute what this diet looked like. They took people, so for the low carb treatment, tossed them in a room. These people have been habituated probably to a, a mixed macro diet. And now they're in a room with like ad libitum nuts around them. Just by habit, they're going to eat. And it takes a little bit of time to maybe start start to adjust. So you'd want longer individual dietary phases to give them a fair trial. And then you need a much longer washout period so that you assure that the one diet doesn't affect the other diet. In this case, the low-carb diet had a beneficial effect. And the low-fat diet that followed it effectively stole credit for the beneficial effects of the, the, the low-carb diet, which were then realized in the following weeks, during which participants happened to be eating the... Um, low carb diet. And we yeah. actually, yeah. No, I was going to say the problem, <laughs> the problem is, and it's always a solution. You know, when you have some BS out there, it takes like 10 times the effort to refute it. 
And what you're, the concept you're describing is, is more complicated for most people to see. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll look at the study and say, oh, low fat, ate less calories. And you're saying, wait a minute, there's all these physiological things that are happening and it's more complicated. I mean, it's just, I, I, it is what it is, but it's just, a, it's, it's just more challenging to make the argument when you have to spend, you know, 15 minutes mm-hmm. making that argument. I mean, that's just, just one of the realities of it. I'm just there's, thinking that as I listen here and I, and I, I get, I mean, I get it completely, Nick, but mm-hmm. I'm just thinking about the average listener might say, well, this is really complicated. I don't really understand it. Um, Here's one how thing, I boil it down. Yeah, go I have ahead an analogy. Boil it down. Boil it down. So um, I, I, I agree. This is a hard thing to translate. Um, the analogy I posted to Twitter this morning, you might have seen, was that of baking a cake. And the concept here is it's pretty intrinsically obvious. In baking a cake, order of events matters. You take the wet ingredients, you take the dry ingredients, you mix them together, and you bake them. And the order of events is important to the chemistry of baking a cake. And you do it properly, you end up with a cake. But what if you change the order of events? You have the same steps, but you change the order of events such that you do, I'm going to take the dry ingredients, the salts, the flour, the sugar, and I'm going to pop them in the oven and bake them. Then I'm going to take them out and I'm going to crack some eggs on top. You're not going to end up with a cake. You're going to end up with a burnt pile of sugary, floury mush with yolks on top. They're two very different outcomes because the chemistry of the process has been changed by the order. And it's the same exact thing, pretty much. I mean, I think it's a fair analogy for human dietary trials like this, a crossover trial without a washout, the chemistry is affected by the sequence. Yeah, It's makes- very, very important. And what's deceptive, or I think was deceptive, is that in the initial trial, they did say they looked for diet carryover effects and didn't find them and didn't provide data showing that they looked for them. So it's a little bit misleading, especially when the effects are so massive. It's kind of hard to miss if you really look for them. And there's many ways to skin a cat. And in this reanalysis, we actually skinned the cat in many different ways, and we're able to show even biological markers of the carryover effect. So I can show you that in um, figures um, three, and then especially figure four. Yeah. So if we look look at figure three. C peptide was one you guys guys were looking at, I think. um, That's the money shot. Yeah. So, so first we'll look at the, this is this figure three. And what you're looking at here is beta hydroxybutyrate level starting on panel A on the low carb diet broken down by diet order. So what you see is if you have the low carb diet first on the low carb phase, you ended up with much higher BHB levels than if you had priming by the low fat diet first. So if the low carb diet came second, that's kind of the second box over, um, which means the low fat diet came first, your, your body was primed not to be able to go into as deep ketosis. So there's clearly a carryover effect here based on just looking at beta hydroxybutyrate circulating ketone levels during the low carb diet, depending on whether or not It was biased by a preceding low-fat diet. And then if you go over to panel B, you're looking at the respiratory quotient. So a respiratory quotient um, is a a ratio that tells you basically how much carb versus fat burning you're doing with um, a lower number being more relative fat burning. So what you see here is if you have the low-carb diet first, that's like in the whole panel, the third over on panel B, um, the the first one on the left, you have a low-carb diet first, you have a lower respiratory quotient on the low-fat phase. So basically, even in the low-fat phase, there's a carryover from the low-carb phase where you're still doing more um, fat burning versus if you look at the uh, respiratory quotient during the low-fat phase, if the low-carb came second, then you're burning less fat. So this is a little bit complicated. People can pause it, rewind, rewatch. But the bottom line here is you're looking at beta hydroxybutyrate levels in the low carb diet or respiratory quotient of the low fat diet. And whether or not the low carb or low fat diet came first or second had a massive effect on circulating BHB levels and respiratory quotient in a given phase, just really providing proof that and there the, was a diet carryover effect. Uh, just a question on this. Uh, how long did that persist? Because when I'm looking to, for instance, the ketone levels, low carb first, you know, your your sort of average beta hydroxybutyrate level was about 1.6 millimolar. Did that persist to the entire four weeks or did it decline or do we know how long that that persisted for? Um, I don't have that information on the top of my head. It was coded into R by Adrian. I think this is an average over time, but awesome. I'd be certain that over time it's going to um be adjusted based on, you know, what diet you're on. So let's say if you're going from low fat to low carb, obviously day one, your ketones are going to be very low of low carb. After two weeks, they're probably going to have risen and vice versa. Um, If you know, you go low fat coming right off of low carb, your ketones are going to be higher day one and start to drop. 
And it's the same thing for the respiratory quotient. Bottom line is over the two weeks, they're going to be trending adaptations in the direction of whatever diet there is. But even after two weeks, the effects weren't complete. And critically, they didn't reverse the next day, yeah. which is why the washout would have been so critical because there's clearly a bleeding over of one dietary phase into another, which overall had a massive biasing effect on the results. Now, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm just kind of getting at is how long that lasted for. If it lasts for a week, then you've got a week of basically the same physiology as you did on the, on the baseline diet. So yeah, um, it's more than two weeks. Based on other data, you know, the, I think the 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 effect would be more than two weeks. I would say for a fair trial, you probably want want something more like four weeks. Um, but um, yeah, the, the the dietary phase was certainly not sufficient to really have any major impact on on the carryover effect. It was inappropriately short without a washout. Yeah, and this is a C peptide uh, data, which I think is pretty fascinating. And I think I this mean, is maybe- the money shot. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess a quick explanation of what C peptide is for people that aren't familiar with it. It's part of the when they make insulin, it's insulin's pre pro insulin, and then the C peptide's cleaved off. And so, basically, what whatever your pancreas secretes in insulin, you get the exact same amount of C peptide. And then insulin is rapidly disposed of, so it's not a good not it's not as good of a marker as C peptide, right? Yeah. So, um, as you mentioned, when the 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 pre pro insulin process, you end up chopping up that protein into components. One is C peptide, one is insulin. So you have a one-to-one secretion um, of um, insulin and C peptide from your beta cell. So you can think of C peptide as a marker of insulin release. That's the simplest way to think about it. In this context, it ends up being a better assay for insulin release because the insulin is processed by the liver in a way that is biased by the macronutrient composition of the diet. So because there's a macronutrient shift, how much insulin gets processed is going to be altered by dietary phase. So if you want to figure out, you know, how much insulin was released, you probably want to look at C peptide um, in this particular context. But the prediction, so let's take a step back and kind of compare the two models, right? You have the carbohydrate insulin model and the energy balance model. Both obey the laws of physics. Both, you know, accept that energy is conserved, energy in minus energy out equals energy gained, fat stored, whatever you want to call it. The distinction is that there's an equal sign there. It doesn't imply causality. The standard framework would be, oh, it's kind of um, a, an arrow of causality towards E in minus E out points to fat stored. So basically you can like shove calories in and gain weight, which over the short term you can. Over the long term might not as not be might might not be as physiologically relevant to the obesity epidemic. The carbohydrate insulin model obeys the laws of physics but inverts the causal arrow and basically says, okay, if you have a high glycemic low diet and your insulin and glucose are spiking, you'll end up with more insulin, more insulin area under the curve that sends the signal to fat cells to store fat. So they want to suck in calories and they want to produce a positive energy balance. So that causes you to be hungrier and also changes energy expenditure, which has been shown in other studies. But just looking at the one component there, energy intake, what the carbohydrate insulin model will predict is if you have higher insulin, then after the fact, you're going to eat more in order to fill your fat cells, which want to be filled if we're to anthropomorphize for a minute. So what was done for this figure, starting first on A, is to look at exactly that. Can we look at the C peptide, a, a marker of insulin release, in the first phase and this is basically, this is blinded to dietary phase. Now, of course, if you're eating a higher carb diet, you're probably going to secrete more insulin. But nevertheless, can we just look at C-peptide in the first phase? And the carbohydrate insulin model would predict that downstream of that, you're going to want to eat more calories because your fat cells are trying to fill themselves up because they've gotten the signal for insulin. Do we see that? We absolutely see that. If you go more to the right, the C-peptide's higher, energy intake goes up. And that also correlates with fat loss change. That's in panel B. Change in C-peptide, like higher C-peptide um, change, um, will lead to more fat gain. So the reason I love this is because it's taking data from this initial 2021 trial, which literally said it contradicts the carbohydrate insulin model. The reanalysis invalidates the initial study, um, although it shows a benefit for the low-carb diet if you just look at the, you know, the first phase, particularly the second week of the first phase, where there wasn't a biasing effect from a prior phase. And then we can actually use C-peptide to test a prediction of the carbohydrate insulin model, 
Does phase one insulin release as measured by C-peptide affect energy intake and fat gain in phase two? And it absolutely does, as we see here, providing pretty solid evidence consistent with the carbohydrate insulin model, which again is completely opposite the narrative from the original study. So the two main takeaways are the initial study has a fundamental flaw, lack of a washout major diet carryover, which invalidates the main results. But what we can extract is that there does appear to be first phase trending benefit towards carbohydrate, low carbohydrate diet and data that are strongly supportive of the carbohydrate insulin model. So you can see why this is such a narrative flip. So Kevin Hall's group went to the trouble of measuring C-peptide. What did they do with that data? I mean, because they had to have seen what the peptide C-peptide levels were during the, during all the phases. I mean, did they comment on C-peptide levels at all? They haven't. I'm actually waiting. So um, this paper, our reanalysis came out very late on the 18th. I saw it the morning of the 19th being released. And so I've been very interested to see what um, Kevin Hall's group would say in order to explain, you know, the findings. What I showed you before is has been his only reply, which I found very interesting because basically he just showed that, again, if you lump everything, low fat is, I guess, you know, has lower intake than low carb, but just completely overlooks the fact that there is a massive diet carryover effect. So what I'm doing here in this, you know, graphic I showed earlier was these, the, the thing on the left is not mine. That's taken from the preprint, not peer reviewed yet, but the preprint by Kevin Hall's group himself which he didn't comment on after we published our own explanation showing this massive diet carryover effect, which you can very clearly see by comparing it to his tweet taken from the, the you know prior study, but not in his reanalysis, that it muddies the water. If you group these things, it completely just you know uh, obscures the diet carryover, or it's not showing the diet carryover effect, which I think is tremendously misleading. He hasn't commented on the diet carryover effect yet. I went to his replies just before this, so it'll be interesting. And in his preprint, there isn't really any discussion of um, you know, how this is tested by the carbohydrate insulin model, R figure four. I mean, he's gonna have the opportunity to address that in his revisions of the preprint before it goes through peer review and is eventually published. So he's gonna have the opportunity to do that. Um, but you know, I, I think one could come up with a few explanations, you always can in science, for what accounted for the diet carryover effect. I read the preprint. There was some stuff about like changes in, you know, gastric capacity and, you know, density of the diet, not supported by any real references. I've dug, dug into that. Like, you know, does your stomach expand or shrink? And there doesn't really appear to be any, you know, clinically meaningful effect, especially in a mixed diet context. So I guess the question you have to ask yourself is we all acknowledge now in 2023, as opposed to in 2021, there is a massive diet carryover effect, huge, bigger than the actual, you know, diet effect itself, um, that's agreed upon now. So the question is, what can account for that? We provide data, as shown in figures three and four, that the carbohydrate insulin model can explain it, that there's biological information in the trial consistent with that. This is the body of literature behind it supporting that explanation. And the question is, can you come up with a better explanation that's supported by data? And I don't see that happening, but they're welcome to try. Yeah, one of this is kind of an aside, but I think it's an important thing. You know, when, when I had a discussion with you and, and Adrian Sotomoto the other day, talking about the fact why C peptide is superior, um, you know, because a lot of the insulin becomes sequestered in the liver and doesn't really make it into systemic circulation. So when we're looking at things like, uh, for instance, insulin resistance scores, home IRs, and say like we're we're often looking at fasting insulins, is that study then maybe less perhaps? useful maybe we should be using c-peptide as a better marker perhaps i'm just i'm just kind of wondering because of that effect you know if my fasting insulin is two but 80 percent of it's sitting in my liver you know you see where i'm going with that where where it may not be as helpful yeah. well the homo ir is a composite of um fasting glucose and insulin levels correct right uh, but, it, it, but that insulin itself. is is it systemic insulin or is it or is most of that in the liver you know that's a question it's, well, obviously they're not doing, I mean, I don't think you go into a clinic and get your portal vein tapped. Right, right. Exactly. So what's, what actually, what, how much, how much insulin do you actually have in your whole body if, if, if 80% of it's in your liver, you know, or something like that? Right. I think the presumption, and this is the presumption for a lot of tests that you get, including something as simple as a thyroid, um, 
that, you know, people are on a mixed macronutrient diet and that assumption is built in. And you probably know from looking at, you know, patient studies, dietary context matters. I mean, the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype is a phenomenal example of that, where your physiology changes, your hormone sensitivities change, you know, ratios change based on dietary context. The presumption from tests and then, you know, reference ranges basically is people are eating normal diets. Right. I don't necessarily think that's a, a fair presumption, but it's effectively what we're working with. Well, so that, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's fair for probably 95% of the patients you run into. I mean, that's, yeah. that's true, but I mean, you get these outliers and, you know, you mentioned like, you know, we talk about insulin resistance, but we don't even consider thyroid resistant, androgen resistance, you know, leptin resistance. You know, I mean, you, any, every, every single signaling molecule has a receptor and that receptor yeah. is variably sensitive, sensitive. So again, it's, there's so much more to yeah. it, right? You can actually, I'll tease data coming out. I'm pretty sure it's hitting print tomorrow. The abstract's already been published, but we were working with a, um, a PhD student who won, ran a wonderful trial where she took lean, healthy women and put them, um, they were actually hab habituated. They had been eating a low carb diet, um, ketogenic for about 3.9 years on average, but they had, you know, a first phase where they remain keto. Then they added back carbs in line with the UK healthy eating guidelines. So they're eating like 200 ish grams of carbs per day to drop out of ketosis, then went back into ketosis. And we were actually looking at uh, predictions of the lipid energy model. But one of the things we looked at as the function of that was thyroid. And what you end up seeing in the trial is when they add back carbs, the, the free T3, which is the quote, active thyroid hormone goes down, which is consistent with other literature. Sorry, when they add back carbs, it goes up, yeah, which yeah. is consistent with other literature, higher carb, you're going to have higher thyroid. But what does that translate to? Because people think of, oh, say you're hyperthyroid, you have a high metabolism and you're burning a lot of things. You have hypothyroid, you're, you know, caloric in expenditure is probably going to be down. Your metabolism is slower, right? So are you saying, oh, higher thyroid when you add back carb is going to increase your metabolism? Well, no, because we can look at um, resting energy expenditure or basal metabolic rate. And if you have lower thyroid on low carb, there's not any cost to energy expenditure. There's no change in other things like the feedback loop, the TSH as well. And these are healthy women. So I'm not thinking sick you thyroid or anything, or for any other reason, would I have a reason to think that? So the bottom line is, for a given hormone, there can be a different physiological outcome, probably because of some sensitivity in that access. Access. You don't need as much thyroid to get as much metabolic bang for your buck. So for a lower free T3, you can have the same metabolic rate because signaling is the same, even if the thyroid hormone is lower because you're just more sensitive. Yeah, yeah. And I think Steve Finney has talked about that even several yeah. years ago. I've seen him write a, write a paper on that. I, I do see that clinically. T3 will drop on low carb, but they're asymptomatic. And I'm like, well, you're asymptomatic. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, they're what, asymptomatic. What, 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 Their basal metabolic rate is totally normal. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we'll more to come. I know you guys got a lot of, a lot of other great things in the pipeline that we'll, I guess you'll re reveal <laughs> when the time is right. So looking forward yeah. to that stuff. So, I mean, the baseline here is Kevin Hall's study saying low fat was better than low carb has a fatal flaw in the fact that they did not account for the effect, the carryover effect of being on a low carb first, which dramatically changed the outcome more so than much more so than any differences in the dietary makeup uh, overall. Yeah. Correct. That's, that's the message here. That's correct. I would add one more thing that Adrian pointed out when we were on our Instagram live the other day, which is, you know, we have kind of three buckets of big takeaways from this. We have that the initial study results are invalid because of the diet carryover effect that what we can extract is consistent with the carbohydrate insulin model. The third thing is this isn't just about overturning the results, the findings of a prior 2021 nature medicine study, although I think it does that, but informing future trial design. Because we can look and learn from this history about why this was so flawed and why it was misleading and use that information to design future trials. Now, the NIH has just announced a well over $100 million budget for a precision nutrition initiative. And I think what we'd want is that taxpayer money to be spent in the optimal manner. And so looking at data like this, and we're going to be looking at, you know, some other things in line with this uh, path on, you know, investigating optimal trial design and flaws in trial design, it should inform how those, you know, what is it, nine figures in taxpayer money are spent. Because we want, you know, data that are useful to help with the obesity epidemic, not things that muddy the water. So, um, yeah, there will definitely be a lot to come. And it'll be interesting to see how the discussion around this particular publication 
uh, evolves. And I appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and share it because, yeah, as you mentioned, it's, it's a tricky thing to communicate to a lay audience because you can just say, oh, you know, it's a metabolic ward trial. That's a randomized controlled trial. So, you know, whatever the conclusions of the trial say must be gospel. And what we see here is that there are, you know, really key methodological things that can lead to profoundly misleading results. And if you take nothing away else away from it, think about like that cake analogy. The order of events in the study really matters in order to get, you know, the outcome you want in this perverse analogy, a cake rather than a burnt pile of mush with egg yolks on top. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank, and I, I think that's a good way to explain that. And I just, like I said, with a hundred million dollars, hopefully they won't spend fifty million of it doing uh, uh, analysis of NH NHANES data and food frequency questionnaire nonsense, which just is a waste of everybody's time, in my view. But anyway, Let's yeah, see. I'll have one more question for you, Sean. Yeah, um, I was so I was I've been critical of the study before this reanalysis for various reasons. The washout period was something I had targeted. I also found the design choice of the diets interesting i don't know if you went to the methods of the original study i looked at some looked of the pictures yeah the pictures were not what i would eat personally but yeah i mean i saw that yeah yeah, yeah I, I uh i thought that was an interesting interesting choice so for reference the animal they said minimally processed animal-based ketogenic diet and it was like ad libitum roasted salted peanuts fried chicken salad broccoli alfredo I see a lot of people having success on keto. I don't see them eating that. So even, you know, I, I do feel that this trial tried to straw man, in my opinion, this is a side comment, a keto diet. So it's interesting to see that the data still bear out really in favor of a positive effect for a low carb diet over a low fat diet. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, if they would have asked, say, Eric Westman or somebody to design their keto diet, I don't think he would have come up with that, you know, or, or something. And I, you know, it's, it's, you know, like I said, if I were to design a vegan diet, I could certainly design it for failure, like Oreos and Coca Cola and say they call it a vegan diet. So you can see where that's, that's the case. And like I said, in future studies, if there's ever a carnivore versus vegan study, hopefully we can get a vegan to design it or, you know, like I suggested, you know, maybe using the same company that uh, 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 Stanford guy, uh, Christopher Gardner, Gardner. Is, and use their exact same yeah. food and say, hey, this is what they get, those they used and something along those lines. Yeah. yeah, you could do that or you could just have, well, this wouldn't work for carnivore versus vegan. But like what David Ludwig did in his Framingham food trial is he actually had the exact same foods the same menu, but he changed the ratios of different foods in order to keep it, you know, similar protein, but swap out fat for carbs. So the low carb group would have had say some orange juice, but a tiny, tiny little bit. And then say more of other things that were lower carb, um, higher fat. So you can do that because that provides a perfect intensity control. You actually have all the same foods and you're just changing the ratios a little bit. So there are ways to steel man it. And, you know, I, that can be done. It's you know, interesting the way they chose to design it. Nevertheless, that's again, a tangent point, little chip on my shoulder that I wanted to bring up because I thought it was interesting, not really prevalent to the main discussion we were having, which had to do with these massive diet carryover effects and the support of the carbohydrate insulin model. So yeah, I, I hope this resonates with people and they see why it's so important. All right. So Nick, if somebody seeing this has more questions about that, where, where can I get more information? I know a lot of people, this may go over their heads for some, some may get it, you know, depending if they want to just maybe sort of learn a little more so they can understand it better. Where, where, where might they go? Yeah. So um, on Twitter, um, myself at Nick Norwitz, um, also um, Adrian Sotomoda, the uh, lead author on this, and then the senior author, David Ludwig at David Ludwig MD. We'd all be happy to reply to questions on Twitter. So maybe you can drop our handles below. And then I have a video abstract. Um, it's about seven minutes long, breaking it down with nice graphics, which you can maybe also link below. And if you post questions to the comments on that YouTube, I'll be notified. And I, I try to get to as many comments as I can. So I, I appreciate questions because I realize this is a, um, a, a difficult thing to understand, but I appreciate you all bearing with us to try to understand it because I think it's incredibly important in order to understand this. So you can kind of think about how to process information that might be coming out that, you know, what comes out today, two years later, there could be a reanalysis and it could find that, you know, the results are actually opposite what is being put forth right now in your newsfeed. I'm going to stop it right there, Nick. So.